Engaging citizens. A game changer for development? Improving service delivery in the health and education sectors. Sent Ghana and Care International. Although Ghana's success in having poverty has widely been acclaimed, the country's poor performance on maternal mortality has drawn similar attention. In 2008, Ghana recorded 451 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. This prompted government to declare maternal mortality a national emergency requiring immediate action to reverse the trend. The Ministry of Health and the Ghana Health Service designed and implemented initiatives including free maternal health policy, comprehensive obstetric and abortion care, and preventive measures including health education. Notwithstanding significant contributions made by these initiatives, safe motherhood indicators showed limited progress and could be attributed to low investment, inequitable allocation, and inefficient use of the available resources. Recognizing that citizens and civil society's vigilance at the local and national level is essential in ensuring effective utilization of the limited resources and advocating for increased budgetary allocations, Send Ghana mobilized grassroots citizens to promote demand-side accountability in maternal health delivery. We targeted districts which had shown poor performance on meeting the Millennium Development Goal 5 on improving maternal health and worked with our grassroots partners to strengthen demand-side accountability. For instance, in the Kwandai district in Northern Region, we targeted pregnant women, lactating mothers, spouses and citizens, including persons with disability. District-specific problems included, one, limited education on maternal health policies and programs, two, a poor road network and lack of access to referral facilities. Three, inadequately qualified health professionals and poor attitude of health workers. Four, a lack of resources and timely expenditure resulting in essential drugs being out of stock and lack of basic equipment due to low budgetary allocations. Five, a lack of opportunity and outlet for citizens to demand accountability for improved maternal health service delivery. In order to address these issues, community debates and community radio stations were used to spread information on maternal health issues to the citizens of Nyango and their leaders, enabling them to demand better services. Send work closely to bring the service delivery providers, that is the district health directorate, and citizens together to resolve critical issues in the delivery of maternal health services. In addition to using demand-side accountability to improve the effectiveness and use of resources, SEND also used participatory monitoring and public expenditure tracking survey reports and findings to engage government service providers, first at district and later at national levels, to increase demand on maternal health care in the district. Specifically, based on the results of the survey and monitoring, and on the basis of the District Citizen Monitoring Committee's demands during district-level policy dialogue, the District Assembly and District Health Directorate collectively committed to increase spending on maternal health by one, constructing, completing, and or refurbishing CHIPS compound in the district. Two, extending electricity to CHIPS compound that required it, and three, upgrade on motorable roads, especially those leading to health facilities, including chief compound. The district citizen monitoring committees then followed up to ensure that the district health directed and the district assembly fulfilled these promises. As a result of a focus on demand-side accountability, with the support of district citizens monitoring committees, the health-seeking behavior of the affected communities, particularly on maternal health, and family planning services improved. Through the implementation of our project and challenges encountered, we have learned the following. Government responsiveness to citizens' demand is possible if A, evidence is strong and backed by a broad-based citizens' group with the involvement of those affected by the problem. B, 
demand making is sustained through various means, including the media. CSO's influence on government in the health sector is minimal due to a weak capacity to gather evidence on the policy impact on the poor to back demand for alternative approaches. B. Weak linkages within the CSO sector at community, district, regional, and national levels. C. Weak partnership between CSOs and the media and ICT platforms. ICT is a multiplier for A. Effective and efficient information collection, data analysis, knowledge management, and information dissemination. B. Amplification of citizens' voice and diversity in sector. C. Mobilizations of ally and D, real-time interactive platform for citizen government engagement. A programming approach that integrates government and CSO capacity building facilitate responsiveness and sustainability through A, building trust and confidence to work together, B, enhancing shared local ownership, C, signing memorandum of understanding and building partnership at the inception phase to secure commitment from duty bearers is critical in making information available to citizens. And D, evolving mechanisms to ensure every stakeholder has the confidence to engage. Community acting planning is a community-driven process that allows community members to be part of the planning, implementation, and monitoring of community development at the district and at the community level. It involves local community members being guided by local facilitators, working together with district officers and other community workers to conduct an assessment of their needs and resources, and also to collectively identify their vision, strategies, and actions to address those needs. What has been some of the impact of this model of community action plans? KM partners have conducted various impact evaluations that established that community action plan approach is effective. First, it is effective in mobilizing and strengthening citizens' participation and voice in community and district level planning and implementation process. It also empowers communities to take ownership of their own development process. Secondly, community action plan is an excellent platform for promoting representation and participation of vulnerable groups for facilitating discussion around gender equity, access to productive resources, etc. Thirdly, community action planning provides a platform for dialogue and negotiation and accountability between citizens and their local authority. Lastly, the community action plan process actually increases the capacity of community members to engage and negotiate their needs with local authorities and different service providers at the community level. Our impact study has also noted an increase in voluntary contributions by citizens towards local development initiatives. With regard to access to basic services, which is the bottom line for community development actually, the study has revealed that there has been evidence in terms of improving access to basic services, especially through provision of infrastructure in education and health. In one district in northern Ghana, 33 new primary schools were constructed and put into use. These schools are equipped with water points and they are now connected to the Ghana School Feeding Program. This has contributed to reducing the phenomena of schools under trees in most parts of northern Ghana. It has also helped to improve school enrollment. In the health sector, the district assembly have been able to build six rural clinics, one office complex, and has sponsored 150 nursing students and six medical trainees to attain higher education. So overall, the district planning authorities have been using the community action plan model as a guide to allocating resources to address the priority needs that are coming from the communities involved. One other main achievement of the CAP process is the institutionalization of the model at the national level. It's not enough to do work at the community level, but how that work is fit in the national level process is very important for us. So in 2014, through the advocacy work of care and partners, the National Development Planning Commission in Ghana adopted the Community Action Planning Model as part of the legal and operational framework for district development planning process in Ghana. In terms of lessons learned, the key enabling factor for community action plan to be effective are 1. 
the existence of a decentralized national development planning system that is open to citizens' participation. Second, the participation of key decision makers throughout the CAP process is very important. Thirdly, it requires competent local facilitators to handle the process. Fourth, it also needs a culture of monitoring and learning and gathering and sharing evidence across. Last but not the least, it requires multi-sectoral collaboration with and between other or existing programs. Some challenges observed with the community action plan implementation process include the fact that it can tend to focus primarily on infrastructure development and less on capacity development, especially of the local government authority to be effectively involved in the process. Moreover, there is uncertain and inadequate funding coming from the local government authorities, and this can affect the actual impact of the community action plans. Therefore, our conclusion is that community action plan yields best result when it is integrated or complemented by policy advocacy by citizens or complemented by social accountability measures and when it is also integrated or complemented by other interventions that increase the capability and responsiveness of duty bearers. One specific approach that CARE has found work very well across different sectors is the community scorecard. It was generated by CARE in Malawi more than a decade ago for a health project, and since then it has been applied in many countries and to many other sectors, including education, infrastructure, agriculture, water and sanitation. Regardless to the sector, community scorecard provides a straightforward and easy process for users to assess and monitor the quality of the services that they receive. So, how does it work? Service users start discussing in focus group the obstacle that they face in accessing services. Based on this discussion, they identify a set of indicators and they score the services against this indicator. Then service providers do the same thing and score the services they provide against the same indicators. Finally, both service user and service provider come together to compare the result of the scoring and discuss what are the issues that the community faces in accessing good quality services that actually respond to their needs. Very importantly, during this interface meeting, they also discuss possible solutions and action to address the identified problem. The result of the process is an action plan with clear deliverables, a time frame and responsibility. So the community scorecard offers a constructive approach to improving service delivery. So while it was important to understand how the community scorecard is a straightforward process, the most relevant aspect of this discussion is around the impact of community scorecard and how they deliver on improved results. The research found that the community scorecard achieved both instrumental and institutional changes. In other words, that they have an impact in promoting the access and quality of services, and at the same time in changing the behavior of user and provider and their relationship. In terms of improvement in the provision of services, impact was found in different aspects. We found an improvement in the construction and rehabilitation of infrastructure. We have many examples where health centers, nursery, staff housing were either repaired or built, where water point and pipeline were built, and road rehabilitated. Behind all this, there is a collective effort where typically local authorities contribute with material and community members with their own free labor. We also found evidences of alteration in working practices with the creation of an out-of-hour health service in Tanzania, mobile HIV and reproductive health service in Rwanda, among other services. All these changes in the staff schedule and deployment were put in place in response to the specific need of rural community that emerged during the community scorecard. We also found an improvement in the resources with budget and staff reallocated to the area covered by the community scorecard. Lastly, we found an improvement in the staff discipline. We have example of transferring aggressive staff in the health and education sector, dismissal of a head teacher, and ending of attempts by the education staff to extort funds from parents. We also have example for the water and sanitation sector, with improvement in the practice of chlorination of water points in Ethiopia. So now, in terms of institutional improvement, we have found a change in the attitude and behavior of both service user and service provider, and improving in their mutual trust. Users have a sense of empowerment and community over services. They feel that they better know their entitlement, they are better able to stand up in front of service providers and articulate their needs. 
On the other hand, frontline staff performance has improved as well, with service providers being more respectful, open to listen to community demands, and being responsive to their requests. Very importantly, service providers also feel that they are able to explain their own limits in terms of budget and capacity constraint. So overall, this has brought an improvement in the relationship between service provider and service user, with an increase in the mutual understanding, respect, and eventually trust. First, the tool approach and focusing on the demand side does not work. We need to be strategic and focus also on the supply side. Crucial to this process, in fact, is the engagement with frontline providers and local authorities. We need to be politically smart and understand who are the game changers in each specific context. The second lesson learned is that a constructive approach based on dialogue and not on blaming and shaming works well to build service provider incentive to engage. Community SCOCA are not about mobilizing citizens against the government and creating division. Rather the contrary, it is about creating a multi-stakeholder platform for dialogue where solutions to collective action problems can be discussed and collectively devised. The third lesson learned is that bottom-up accountability approaches work better in contexts where top-down performance assessment and other accountability mechanisms are in place. Last lesson learned is of vertical integration. Linking local community scorecard processes to national level policy discussion is challenging. We have evidences showing that community scorecard work as a mechanism to solve local collective action problems. But scaling up at the national level is far more complex. To conclude the discussion, while the international development community focuses mainly on impact and simply asking whether citizen engagement is working or not, I think that the right question is more complex than that. And it's more about under what circumstances and where are these approaches working. And I think that practitioners and learners like you have a lot to contribute to answering this question and to better understanding what tools and what approaches to citizen engagement are most effective in different sectors and contexts.